Welcome back to ECOR Academy students. My name is Anitha Raj and I am one of the teachers and co-founders here along with my younger brother AJ Raj. As you can see, I have a new Algebra 2 lesson prepared for you. Nothing new, nothing out of the ordinary. We're just going to be continuing our mini unit on the quadratic formula. So in part one, I introduced you to exactly what the quadratic formula was. In our last part, part two, we did a practice problem together using the quadratic formula. And now we're going to be doing another topic that's related, that's loosely related to the quadratic formula because we use a part of the quadratic formula for this but you can consider it its own topic. I just put it under the quadratic formula for like organizational reasons because we studied this as part of our lesson for the quadratic formula when I was in class taking algebra two. But today we're gonna be understanding what the discriminant is. So we're gonna be looking at what the discriminant is and the reason we look at the discriminant is so that we know how many solutions we are looking for with a quadratic equation. In my past videos on quadratics, you've probably heard me say, oh, this quadratic has two solutions. Like I tell you ahead of time before we even solve the quadratic, this quadratic has two solutions or this quadratic has one solution. And you might be wondering, why do some quadratics have one solution? Why do some quadratics have two solutions? And sometimes you might have a quadratic that has no solutions at all. So those are your three main, those are your three possibilities. And as we go through this, this lesson I have prepared for you today, you'll, you'll begin to understand this concept. You'll especially understand where we get that no solution from. I know that like trips a lot of people up. And I just want you to keep in mind the concept that the x-intercepts, so where the quadratic, uh, your quadratic function graphed as in your parabola, your x-intercepts are where that parabola touches the x-axis, so where it goes through the x-axis. Just like you have a y-intercept, which is your b in slope-intercept form, so when we have y equals mx plus b in a linear equation, b signifies your y-intercept where that line passes through the y-axis. Similarly, in quadratics, we look at the x-intercept, so where the where the parabola touches the x-axis. And there are three possibilities. It can be it can touch the x-axis twice, once, or not at all. And we'll be seeing that on the next slide. So before I even get into the lesson today, I would really appreciate it if you hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the post notification bell. Feel free to drop a comment down below if you wish, and please use our socials in the description box below to share this video as much as you can. Okay, so now let's look at the three possibilities that I mentioned on the previous slide. So the three possibilities. The first one is two x-intercepts, and this is typically what we've been seeing with our quadratic with our quadratic equations whenever we solve we typically get two different solutions and i told you that's partially because of that x squared term that is that is characteristic of quadratic equations there is that one instance where we solved a perfect square trinomial and we only got one solution we'll be looking at that next on this slide but just for now this this graph shows a quadratic equation when graphed as its para parabolic form has two x intercepts that means if you look at this this parabola right here, it has a positive A value, whether you're in standard form or vertex form. And this parabola here has a negative A value. So the reason we can see this is because this first parabola opens upward. So you can imagine it's like a bowl. The vertex is down here and it's the minimum. So the vertex is the minimum and it's down here on this parabola. And the vertex is up here and it's the maximum on this parabola, as you can see. So what are the x-intercepts? So the x-intercepts, you can also think of them as roots um, solu or solutions, or of course, x-intercepts. Those are like the main three words you will see used to describe them. They are these points right here, this one over here, this one right here that I'm circling, this one right here, and this one right here. Like I said, they're, they are where the parabola touches the x-axis. They are your solutions to this equation. So let's say over here, this looks something like negative 5. So if x equals negative 5 here at this point, then this could possibly, this could be, this would be a solution to your quadratic equation that represents the parabola. So these are instances where when you have a quadratic equation and you solve it and you get two x-intercepts or solutions, these are what the graphs could look like. So let's look at the next one. 
Next one is down here. It is where you have one x-intercept. So again, this graph to the left is just a depiction of one with a positive a value. This one to the right has a negative a value. And as you can see, there's only one point where these two graphs touch the x-axis. And if you do a little bit of deeper thinking, you could probably tell that it's the vertex. So when you have one x intercept, that means the vertex is your solution, is the solution, is your solution or root of the quadratic equation. And the vertex lies on the x axis when you have one x intercept. So let's look at the final possibility. It is where you have no x intercepts. This means you have no solutions at all. This is because if you look here, at this parabola, it's almost like it's floating in the second quadrant. Remember, this is the first quadrant. This is the second quadrant in the coordinate plane. This is the third quadrant, and this is the fourth quadrant. And it forms like a it forms a C. Okay, so if you look at the second quadrant at this at this parabola up here, it, if you see, it's almost like it's floating in the second quadrant. And you might have quadratic equations that, when graphed, make a parabola that looks something like this, where the vertex or none, none, no other points touch the x-axis. So when the parabola doesn't touch the x-axis at all, you don't have any x-intercepts, meaning the parabola doesn't pass through the x-axis or touch it at all. Therefore, you would have no solution. So let me just write it down here. So you would have no solution. Same thing with this other parabola in the fourth quadrant. You can almost see it's floating in the fourth quadrant. It doesn't touch the x-axis at all. Its vertex doesn't touch the x-axis, neither do any other points. It doesn't pass through it at all. It's like going in the total opposite direction of the x-axis. Therefore, we can say that this also doesn't have any x-intercepts. It doesn't intercept the x-axis at all. Therefore, it also doesn't have any solution. So these are the three scenarios you're going to see. You're going to see two x-intercepts, one x-intercept, and no x-intercepts. And you might be thinking right now, how exactly will I know when I'm approaching a quadratic equation if I'm how many solutions I should be looking for? Well, I'm going to be showing you how we do that. And the whole point of the discriminant, which I mentioned when I introduced this video, is to find out how many solutions your quadratic equation has. Okay, so the discriminant. This is the discriminant right here. So this is like the formula you're gonna to use to find out how many solutions your quadratic equation has. And if you remember from my, from my previous two videos, this is why I'm saying that it is very closely, closely but loosely related to the quadratic formula. If you remember the quadratic formula looks something like this, this x, equal, x equals um, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Looks like that. So this discriminant is pretty much whatever is under the radical sign from the quadratic formula. We just took that. And now we're using that to determine how many solutions our quadratic equation has. So like I said, it's used to identify the type and number of solutions a quadratic will yield. So type as in, uh, so sorry, number of solutions as in, obviously, is it going to yield no solutions, one solution, or two solutions, and identify the type. Well, that's like, that's how many x-intercepts you have. So that it just, just it determines what type of parabola you're going to have what, without you having to actually graph your quadratic equation. So refer to the table below, which I'm going to show you, to help you understand this concept. Here's a fun little table I made for you. If you're taking notes on this video, I would highly suggest you copy this table down because it is very, very useful, especially when you're first learning about the discriminant. So in this column right here, it says discriminant. So, uh, so what I mean by this is you can see the b squared minus 4ac written out. Therefore, you're going to be literally taking your standard form, which is ax squared plus bx plus c. And you're going to be taking the a, b, and c value and you're going to be taking those values and you're going to be, they're, they're constants when you have an actual quadratic equation. And you're going to be plugging them into this b squared minus 4ac. So just for the sake of it, let's just say a is equal to, a is equal to 3, b is equal to 2, and c is equal to 1. I'll just say that. So if a was equal to 3, b is equal to 2, c is equal to 1, you would actually, you would plug these in. So b squared is 2 squared, so which would be 4 minus 4 times a times c. 4 times, 4 times a would be, 4 times a would be 4 times 3, which is 12. 
times c, which is 1. So this would be 4 minus 12, and we get negative 8. So that's how you would plug your values into, uh, into this formula we have for the discriminant. You would literally just take your a, b, and c value from standard form and plug them in like you would do in, quadra in the quadratic formula. So if you look here, if we do if we do the discriminant as in if we figure out what our discriminant is by taking our b value squaring it and subtracting our our a and c value multiplied together times 4 from it if we do all of all that math and this is greater than 0 let's say this is equal to 1 or this is equal to 100 if it's any number that's greater than 0 so pretty much any positive number like i wrote over here that means you're going to have two real solutions so that's going to mean that means you're going to have your graph. And then if you remember our first graph from the last slide where it touched the x-axis in two different spots, that is the kind of parabola you're going to have. That means you have two x-intercepts and thus you have two solutions, which is what we've been working with for the most part. So here's another scenario. Let's say you do this b squared minus 4ac to figure out what the discriminant is, and it is equal to 0. So you plug your a, b, and c value in from standard form, and this is equal to 0. If it's equal to 0, that means your, your quadratic formula has one real, one real solution, which was the second scenario I showed you on the last slide. That's where your vertex sits on the x-axis. Your parabola only touches the x-axis in one place. It has only one x-intercept. And this is if, you're, remember, your discriminant is equal to zero. The last possibility is if your discriminant is less than zero. So if it's something like negative three, negative 5.5, negative 200, if it's any number less than zero, meaning it is a negative number, you have no real solution. So your solution is imaginary. It doesn't, it's not a real number. And because we are graphing on like a real co re a coordinate plane of real numbers, we can't graph this. Therefore, there is no solution. That means there are no x-intercepts. So you can imagine that parabola kind of like floating off in the quadrant like we saw in the last scenario on the on the previous slide where it didn't touch the x-intercept at all so if your discriminant is less than zero meaning you get a negative number that means you have no real solution so those are the three possibilities there's that helpful little chart for you so that you can just copy that down and trust me it's very easy to remember so if you want take a second and copy that down and then i'll go to the next slide where we'll do a problem together Okay, so let's do our first problem. So determine the type and number of solutions for the equation below. So 5x squared plus 7x minus 8 is equal to 0. So here's the solution already pre-written. So what we're, what we're pretty much being asked is determine the type and number of solutions. So this question is asking us, how many solutions is this going to have? Is this... Um, is this quadratic equation going to have? They're not asking us to actually solve the quadratic equation. They're simply asking us to find out how many solutions it will produce, meaning what is the discriminant? So we're trying to find the discriminant, and then using the discriminant, we can determine if it's going to have no solutions, one solution, or two solutions. So like I said, the solution is already pre-written for you. If you want to copy that down, I'm going to be rewriting it and going through it with you in just a second. So feel free to copy it down if you would like. Okay, let's actually do this problem together. So the first step is always writing down the formula when you're given a new formula to remember. So because we already know quadratic formula, you should have it memorized at this point. Remembering the formula for the discriminant shouldn't be too difficult. So like I wrote on the previous slide, it's b squared minus 4ac. And remember, we are taking the a, b, and c values from standard form. As you can see, the quadratic equation we were given is already in standard form. 5 is our a value, 7 is our b value, and negative 8 is our c value. So we're pretty much, it's pretty simple. We're just plugging these values in for a, c, a b, and c in our, in our formula for the discriminant. So our b value is 7, so we're going to have 7 squared, because it's b squared, minus 4 times our a value, which is 5, times 5, times our c value, which is negative 8. Remember to pay attention to the signs, or you're going to get the wrong answer, which is something we don't want. So 7 squared, that doesn't look like a 7, okay, 7 squared is 49. Negative 4 times 5 is negative 20, and negative 20 times negative 8 is equal to positive 160, because negative times negative is positive. So we get 49 plus 160, and if we add those together, we end up getting 209. So if we look at 209, we're going to ask ourselves the question, is it greater than 0, is it equal to 0, or is it less than 0? 
Well, we know that it's not less than zero because it's not a negative number, and it's definitely not equal to zero. 209 is not equal to zero. It is a positive number. It is quite large, so we can readily say that it is greater than zero. So if it's greater than zero, then we remember from our chart on the last slide that this should have two real solutions. That is the type of quadratic it is. And then the, and then the number of solutions it has, well, it has two x-intercepts. Sorry, it has, so the type, whoops, so the type it is, is it has two x-intercepts, and then the number of solutions it has is two real solutions. So this, this would look something like that first possibility I showed you on like one of the very first slides where we had those two parabolas that looked something like this, where they touched the x-axis in two different spots, so this quadratic equation passes through the x-axis twice, so it has two different solutions. It would look something like one of those. Okay, so that's how we solve this problem. Let's do something that's a little bit harder because it is gonna be a word problem. So here's the problem. You hit a golf ball into the air from a height of one inch above the ground with an initial velocity of 85 feet per second. And the function h equals negative 16 t squared plus 85 t plus 112 models the height in feet of the ball at time t in seconds. So will the ball reach a height of 115 feet? After reading that, you're probably wondering what in the world is going on because that is quite a hefty long word problem. However, I'm gonna tell you right now that if you look through this, most of it is just composed of information. So we need to pick out the important stuff. So we're told a golf ball is hit in the air from a height of one inch. So try to visualize it. So you're either in a driving range or in a club or somewhere where you're golfing. And when you are getting ready for your turn, you prop the ball up on a tee that is about one inch above the ground. So you pop it up, you pop, you place it one inch above the ground. And then when you swing, you swing with an initial velocity of 85 feet per second. So all of that is good and fun. But the good thing about this problem is that we are not asked to make to make the function that represents the scenario. Luckily, we're already given the function. In most cases, you're just gonna be given the function. All of that information is really meant to just, for lack of a better word, overwhelm you, especially when you're on an assessment or standardized test. You just gotta narrow in on the information you need. And luckily they've given it to us. It's just this, this information is just like masked behind all of these confusing words and numbers. So this is the quadratic equation that represents the scenario. So, um, it represents the height of the ball in feet of at a given time. So after one second, if we plug one in for T, we're gonna find out how high the ball is at that moment. So the question is, so will the ball reach a height of 115 feet? Whoops, that line is very bad, okay. <laughs> Let me underline that again. So will the ball reach a height of 115 feet. So that is the question. And right now you might be kind of confused as to how we're gonna solve this. That is perfectly fine. Because our whole theme is the discriminant, I wanna show you exactly how we are going to use the discriminant to solve this problem. I want you to take a moment to actually look at the problem and make sure you understand that we are not solving anything as in our answer is not gonna be a number. This is more of a yes or no question. So if someone came up to you and asked, so will the ball reach a height of 115 feet? You wouldn't reply 25 seconds. You would reply yes or no. This is a yes or no question. So while we are doing math to figure out the answer, our final answer has to be a yes or a no. So let me just show you the solution pre-written. Here it is. It's not very long. It's not too complicated either. So here's the solution for you. If you want to copy that down, please feel free to do so. I'm going to just run through it again and show you exactly how we get there. Okay, so let's do that. So let's write, let's take the same equation we have right here and kind of rearrange it so that it is very specific to the problem we are being asked. So we are being told that the height is 115 feet. So h is equal to 115 feet because height is 115 feet. It, the, our quadratic function is also equal to h. So h is equal to blah, 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 blah. In this case, h is equal to 115. Therefore, 115 is equal to this quadratic function that we have right here. So we can just substitute 115 in for h. So I can rewrite this as 
115 is equal to negative 16 t squared. I'm literally just taking the quadratic equation they gave us in the problem, plus 85 t plus 112. So this is it rewritten. Okay, so now how are we going to use the discriminant to solve this? Well, we need, for in order to use the discriminant, just like the quadratic formula, the left-hand side of our equation here where the 115 is has to be equal to zero. So it has to be zero equals ax squared plus bx plus c. It has to be in that form. So to get zero on the left-hand side of the equation, it's pretty simple. We can just subtract 115 from both sides. So to get zero, we would do 115 minus 115, and then we would subtract 115 from the right-hand side of the equation, meaning we're subtracting our constants. So we're subtracting 115 from 112. So I'm just going to tell you how to do it now. I'm not going to show you all the math and all that. But what you have to do is you have to convert 115 um, into so that it has the same denominator as 112, meaning if right now it's 115 over 1. That is what this number is. So to get its denominator equal to 12, you have to multiply the numerator by 12 as well. So this 115 with a denominator of 12 would be equal to 1,380 over 12. That's because I multiplied the numerator and the denominator by 12 to get the same denominator. And because we're subtracting it from both sides, we technically have 1 12th minus 1,380 over 12. And 1 minus, 1 minus 1,380 is equal to 1,379. You're just, you're just subtracting 1. It's going to be negative. So this would technically be equal to minus 1,379 over 12. So now what we're going to do is we are going to whip out our <laughs> discriminant. So b squared minus 4ac, because as you can see, our a value is negative 16. Our b value is, um, oops, I forgot to put the t. Our b value is 85, and our c value is negative 1,379 over 12. So now we're going to do b squared minus 4ac, which is our discriminant. So what we're going to do first is we're going to square b, which is 85 squared, minus 4 times a, which is negative 16, times c, which is negative 1,379, sorry, over 12. And 85 squared, I'm just going to tell you, it's 7,225. Of course, for all these simple math, like these simple calculations, I mean, not simple, but like, more long-winded calculations, you'll probably have access to a calculator, but on an assessment, you'll be asked to show your work. And this part that I'm doing right now is the work part of it. So just keep that in mind. Don't panic if you can't do all of this math very quickly in your head. So 85 squared is 7,225. And then if you multiply negative 4 times negative 16 times negative 1,379 over 12, I, I already multiplied it out and I rounded it off. So you would get about negative 7,354.67. And the tricky thing here is that you should know what the sign is. So many of you might get confused and say it's positive. Well, negative times negative is positive, but if you see, we also have another negative sign. So then we'd add the positive times the negative and we would end up getting a negative. So three negatives multiplied together is equal to a negative. That's why we're subtracting 7,354.67. So if we subtract this, this 7,354.67 is roughly, it's a little bit over, it's a little bit over 100 more than 7,225. Therefore, we're going to get a negative number, and it is 129.67. So we just solved the, we just figured out what the discriminant is. So now we have to answer the question, so will the ball reach a height of 115 feet? Well, the answer is going to be no, because this is negative. If the answer was positive, then you could say yes. But because the answer is, is negative, we have to say no. So it will not reach a height of 115 feet. So just so you know, this parabola has no real solutions. And it has no x-intercepts. And that is because 100... <laughs> that is because 129.67 is less than zero. It is a negative number. So that is how we get no. So the answer to this question would be no. You will not reach 115 feet. So that was the last problem, and that's all I have for this a quadratic formula lesson today. Again, a quick recap. We went over what the discriminant was. So we went, we went over the three possibilities of a quadratic equation. You can either have two solutions 
one solution or no solutions at all. Then I went over the discriminant and what it actually is, and I showed you a helpful little table to uh, so you can understand how the values of the discriminant correlate to a specific amount of solution. So if the if the discriminant is positive, you have two solutions. If the discriminant is equal to zero, you have one solution. And if the discriminant is negative, you have no solutions. Then we did a quick problem where I gave you a basic quadratic equation and we applied the discriminant. So we literally just took the A, B, and C values from standard form, plugged them into the discriminant, and then we were able to see that because the discriminant was positive, we have two solutions to that quadratic equation. Lastly, we finished with a word problem where we, would, we were asked if a golf ball would reach a certain height given a certain function that models its height, um, its height given the time. And by applying the discriminant, we were able to figure out that no, the golf ball will not reach that height. So we apply the discriminant in all these different way, ways. It's a very versatile little formula that you can use and it'll be really helpful. Like I said, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please like, subscribe, and hit the post notification bell. Also follow us in our uh, using our socials, which are in the description box below. They include Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to email us, please reach out to us at ecoreacademy at gmail.com. And please stay updated with our socials as we will be informing all of our students when our website is finally, finally launched. Thank you for listening in, and please look out for my next Algebra 2 lesson. Bye!